I, I love the idea of intellectual morality um, because I'm not sure all humans have it. <laughs> but in the <clears throat> excuse me, in the context of um, do dogs in general have it? Um, social species evolutionarily have something like that because you are interdependent. You rely on each other for um, resources, um, for help. And if you watch the way dogs interact, they do very much of the same thing. Um, I don't know whether we can actually test and say, yes, in the same ways that we can determine humans have intellectual morality, dogs have it, because so much of our determinants of those things are verbal. Um, I can say that uh, dogs should have all of the constructs because they've got the same social system. And if you look at the rate of gene changes and substitutions for amino acids in their brain, in fact, dogs are the only other species besides humans that have um, such evidence of so many changes. Um, the, the Swedish dog group has looked at that in depth, and it's really terrific evidence that we probably co-evolved with dogs. So they will have almost without exception the identical social structure that we have. And that means that there are dogs that will adopt other dogs and there are dogs like humans that won't. You know, Bloodlines may mean something to some dogs and the companionship may mean something to others. And we have to acknowledge that because most of us have dogs, if we have more than one, that aren't related to each other. You know, most of us aren't in the business of breeding dogs. So um, while we all do the safe, unsafe thing, every social species does that, you know, um, and it's part of the cooperative effort. They're not going through life every day just saying, are you a threat or are you a risk to me? Or is this someplace I can be safe? Um, abuse the dog, roughly treat it, and you will engender that. That simplistic, I need to know if you're safe or you're a risk, is actually symptomatic of pathology. And we can induce that in dogs, and we do induce it in dogs. I see that in many of my patients. If anything, dogs are the quintessential species that were that probably co-evolved and in the worst case scenario were domesticated to truly work with us in a cooperative sense. So they should have those constructs of not needing to threaten. The whole idea of dominance um, is actually a bad interpretation of the classical literature which restricted the use of dominance as a terminology and a concept to who was the most successful breeder in the group, which often turned out to be the oldest individual, but not always. Um, the most experienced individual. It might have been the individual who knew where most risks were. And it's been not only misapplied in um, the pet dog literature, but it's actually been misused in a lot of the recent scientific literature. And um, all of the training ideas that say you have to dominate the dog, you know, even our military doesn't do that with their troops. And as we've learned more about how people learn and how they build bonds and are willing to work with each other, our military has even shifted to saying what we're doing is we're building up relationships. Um, when all we did was build, you know, tore people down, they discovered they were doing damage. So this whole idea that you dominate something to get them to cooperate it just actually uh, doesn't hold doesn't hold scientific water. It does not mean that every dog is going to be the same. You know, you'll have dogs in your household that are more comfortable in public situations and dogs that are more comfortable in private situations. We all are individual, but we all have in that social construct the ability to cooperate and to defer to others. So in fact, your dogs are always looking to you for um, guidance, not control. And I think when people say you have to dominate the dog, um, it says a lot more about the human than it says about the individual dog. And if the dog does what they want and they attribute that to dominating their dog, um, the dog may be a lot smarter than they're giving them credit for because the dog's doing what they perceive they need to do, exhibit to the dog, to the human to um, manage to make that social relationship work. And the dog may be doing it despite the human, not because of the human. 
And I see dogs every day that are working so hard to please their people and to signal to them that people are oblivious, yet they think the dog is doing what they, they want simply because the dog's smart enough to make sure they offer a set of behaviors that the human um, finds acceptable or in some cases misconstrues. And the dog is working as hard as it can just to stay in the game. Because if you do forceful dog training, you end up with a dog who learns that um, everything depends on force. It's like raising a kid by smacking the kid every time. If that's the child's only way of conflict resolution, I would uh, guess that you have a fairly limited repertoire with which to govern your life. Um, if you look at the way dogs deal with other dogs, um, they don't use force. We mistake a lot of what they do for force. Our whole worldview of what dogs do is all confused by the way people have concentrated on um, conflict resolution and inappropriate conflict resolution. The dogs that I deal with, um, many of whom are quite aggressive, um, who resort to aggression as a way of dealing with their social situation are either pathologically anxious or they're doing it now to survive. I lived with a dog for over a decade um, who was my patient, and you couldn't move um, without telling this dog you were gonna move without him grabbing you. Well, he learned that because he was hung from choke chains and beaten, and he learned that humans were completely unreliable. So his way of dealing with that was to grab them and stop them, and then waiting to see what their response would be. If you were forceful to him, you'd have ended up mauled. He put three people in intensive care. He proved he was serious. Um, that dog turned out to be the dog that taught me how important it was to understand what dogs were thinking and what a difference it could make to realize that so many of their behaviors are about asking for information. And if all you have is a force as a tool, you're giving them information that you're a threat. You will never, ever, ever get that dog to work with you in a trusting relationship. So I see the damage it's done. I just can never see a good reason for it. I understand that when people are hurt or they feel helpless, that they strike out, especially if they've learned that. You know, if that's the way you've learned to handle distress or conflict resolution, or you never learned the ability to walk away from something and cool down, I understand that they lash out at what's nearest to them, but they have to understand they lash out at the thing that is uh, the weakest, and that's usually our pets. I oppose forceful training because it doesn't work, and there are now excellent data to prove it doesn't work, and because I see the damage it does. I see that in my patient population, and I oppose it because it nearly destroyed Flash. I was. I took him because I couldn't kill him, but he was slated for euthanasia. You know, people talk about bully dogs, and they you've got people who like mastiff breeds, and they've got these big, powerful, forceful dogs. And they think that because they've got a big, powerful, forceful dog, they need to be forceful. And um, they, you know, in Philadelphia, what concerns me is that, you know, these dogs are actually, since the Eagles hired Michael Vick, are getting more popular. And um, more than 20,000 pit bulls last year in the city of Philadelphia were seized. And these kids think that these tough dogs give them street cred. So, you know, you've got the well-muscled dog, the myth about how tough they are. And if they're tough, the way you prove you're tough is you're tough back and it gives you street cred, and what they've done is they've created um, a lot of very injured dogs that are euthanized in, in um, humane shelters. And these dogs are often aggressive to other people because they're afraid, you know, whack me a few times and I'm gonna learn to fear you. So, you know, even forceful training, they don't make the distinction between am I reinforcing a bad behavior or a good behavior? So you've got kids who have no idea, and I say kids, they're in their teens, who have no idea about whether or not this is appropriate behavior, trying to look tough, and they've got this breed that everybody thinks is tough, and these dogs 
aren't actually that tough. Because if the dog was truly tough, the dog would be able to say, you know what, I don't have to deal with this and just walk away. Most dogs can't do that. And they can't do that because they are dependent on us. They can't get their dinner unless someone opens the cabinet or the refrigerator. They don't have opposable thumbs. You know, they are dependent on us for everything. And we wanted that. And in fact, if you look at Staffordshire Bull Terriers, one of the breeds that probably went into the American Pit Bull, and you look at them in Australia, they are considered the quintessential family dog. Because they are tough, they're little tanks, they're short, they're relatively small compared to our dogs, and you know, a kid can fall over them but is not going to bowl them over so they're not damaging to kids. And these are actually the phenotypes or behaviors that we see in most of these dogs. You know, the average pit bull that I see as a pet, um, you probably, if you stomped on it enough times, it might react. But these are, these are smart, intelligent, lovely, incredibly gentle dogs. So how does that reconcile with this image that we're talking about? Well, we already talked about force, and we already talked about dominance, and we already talked about fear. And you put those three things together, and then you want a dog that exhibits those. You create that dog by the way you treat it. And the less the human is likely to know about appropriate behavior and how to get the best out of things, the more likely they are to use tough responses to these dogs to the point where they take these dogs and they make them into something that the dogs wouldn't otherwise be. And the dogs are actually fighting for their lives.